Andrew, you and I have a lot of differences, but in this thing, one thing we're alike, we both have a passion for ultimate questions. What's fundamental reality? Is there a reality beyond the physical? Is there a God? All these questions, mm -hmm. but it's not unique to us. This has been over human history. Has human beings have this longing to know about meaning or purpose or reality? Uh, how, how do you, as a, as a scientist, as a quantum physicist today, how, how do you reflect on this long human history to explore ultimate questions? Uh, I've just written a book called The Penultimate Curiosity, and I wrote it with uh, an immensely distinguished painter called Roger Wagner. And that's been inspirational to me because he's helped me to think about a whole lot of questions coming from his background, and he's kind enough to say that he now thinks about a whole lot of questions mm -hmm. that I've prompted in him. And uh, in the book, we're telling how we found that uh, as we look at uh, cultures and communities and individuals throughout human history who've been really interested in these ultimate questions, the sort of ones that you were mentioning, questions about reason, and purpose, and love, and reality, and can God be known, and what happens when we pray, and these really big questions, time and again, that has been conducive to a curiosity about the material world in the kind of way that we might now describe as science. And uh, because uh, Roger's a painter, we thought, you know, how far back can we go in finding this? And we start the story with the paintings in the Chauvet Cave in the Ardèche Gorge in the south of France, which um, have now been dated actually earlier than was previously thought, now about 36,000 years old. And the uh, scientist who headed up the study of those paintings, Jean Clot, uh, has got very good reasons for arguing that the motivation for those paintings was religious. So they weren't decorations for the dining room, they weren't a list of today's menu, but they were in a place that was used not for living in, but for religious ceremonies. And uh, in those paintings you see this astonishing attention to anatomical detail that could only have arisen from a curiosity about how, you know, the animals actually are, in particular the horses' heads. Um, is fantastic. Now, of course, that's long before there was writing, so the only record that we have of their curiosity is what's left in the paintings. But it sort of, as it were, sets an overture for the story that begins mm. to unfold further as writing comes along. So in Miletus, in uh, what's now Western Turkey in the 6th century BC, again you get this curiosity about ultimate reality that led Thales to come up with the concept of Arche, the first cause. And beginning to think about that divine first cause set people free for whole lots of curiosity, uh, set people free for questions about the material world. So instead of thinking of the sun as Helios riding his chariot and earthquakes <laughs> as Poseidon shaking the ground, they began to be able to study these phenomena for themselves in a way that we would now begin to recognize as mm. the origins of scientific thinking. Mm. So in essence, you're saying the, uh, a religious motivation, religious in the broadest possible sense, undergirded uh, humanity's desire to really know what the physical world is. I think that's right, and it wasn't a one-off. You find that story being repeated again and again and again. You find it repeated in um, Athens, with um, Socrates and Plato and Aristotle. Some of these are very well-known figures. You find it repeated with some much less well-known fig figures. So um, we, we made a film about the, you know, for a documentary to go with the book. And we went to uh, Alexandria in Egypt. And we went to where they, uh, 10 years ago, discovered a whole set of lecture theatres. It was a school mm -hmm. of philosophy, if you like, what we would now call a university. Twenty generous-sized lecture theatres. Mm -hmm. And in the 6th century AD, uh, two people went to study there. One was a pagan student called Simplicius, and the other was a Christian student called John Philoponus. 
And between them, they discussed a lot of these religious questions from a pagan, from a Christian point of view. And in particular, John Philoponus, from his Christian questioning, both about the nature of the heavens. So, for example, he disagreed with Aristotle that the heavens were divine. And he, on empirical evidence, showed that Aristotle's arguments didn't mm -hmm. work and said the heavens are part of the material world that we can study like the rest. He also disagreed with um, church members, a monk called Indigo Plurstes, for example, about how we should relate what the Bible says to what we can observe with our eyes and our measurements. And um, so in the context of these questions about the nature of reality, about what is divine, about what the Bible is telling us. John Philoponus made huge advances that were taken up later by um, people like Galileo Galilei mm. and, and Isaac Newton. Mm. So I think most people would agree that the origins of human curiosity that led to, to science had uh, a similar foundation from a, a religious, in the broader sense of the term, mm. uh, motivation. Mm. But many people would say that's ancient history. Yes. That's part of the process. But if we try to generalize that as some big theorem that is continuously true, we would run into trouble mm -hmm. because that that is no longer the case that today science has matured into a um, a very uh, s uh, substantial sophisticated true understanding of reality many open questions mm -hmm. but still heading that way and the old religious way of thinking is archaic mm -hmm. so it would be a mistake to justify a religious participation in ultimate questions today based on the historical truth that it was part of the original motivation for science. Well, wow. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, 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 it's not so ancient as people think. So uh, uh, one of my personal heroes is James Clark Maxwell. I think the way that he unified electricity and magnetism, mm. and then as it turned out, light, must rank as one of the greatest intellectual sure. achievements sure. of the human mind. Mm. Uh, it certainly made a huge difference to almost every technology that we use today that involves any kind of electricity or electronics at all. Um, but, uh, and, and, and he was very strong in the religious motivation of all of his life, including his mathematical and scientific work. But uh, you can think of it um, as a sort of a slipstream. So uh, you can think that um, in, a, in a flock of uh, birds flying in a V formation, the bird at the front has to work harder, yeah. and the next bird uh, gets a benefit from the slipstream created by the first bird. And in fact, they're fantastically clever because they find the place where there's the maximum up current and they even find the phase flapping their right. wings that will maximize this energetic benefit. And uh, runners in a long distance race and in indeed, a marathon and similar. And indeed in a peloton in cycling. Yes, uh, yes. It's very important uh, in the 2016 Olympics, GB <laughs> won a medal yes, congratulations. for the uh, <laughs> cycling that works by the four cyclists, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. judging how they benefit from each other's slipstream. And uh, so you could say that over much of history, these um, uh, ultimate questions have created a slipstream that's been conducive mm. to curiosity about the natural, natural world. I, I think no that's doubt. undoubtedly the case. But as with a petaloton, or as with a flock of birds, uh, they change places, and they take it in turns to do the hard work. And it may well be that we're now at a time where uh, science is at the front of the V formation, the front of the peloton. It's getting the most funding. Um, it's getting uh, more people, more person uh, hours of person years of work going into it. Top brains are going into it. And it may be that's where the hard work is being done. I, for myself, couldn't accept that science is asking all the questions that are worth asking, or indeed has the means to address 
all the questions that are worth asking. And so it may be that we're now in a situation where some of these other questions are benefiting from the slipstream created mm -hmm. by science. Um, you get it in the writings of, um, oh, take someone like Paul Davis, who uh, is a top theoretical cosmologist, but is hugely knowledgeable about other areas. And he says, I'm convinced that the universe has a purpose and that the purpose includes us. Now, that to me is addressing you know, one of the ultimate questions that's worth addressing. Mm. Is there a purpose? And if so, how do we find it? And uh, I think that um, actually particularly for cosmologists maybe, but for people in other branches of sciences too, their science can prompt them to ask questions like that, as it were, to create a slipstream in which these other benefits can get an energetic, uh, these other questions can get an energetic advantage.